with that, I'm going to hand it over to Cisco and Liz, who are both uh, students at Cornell, who are going to be joining us and helping us to build our own cells. So Cisco and Liz, thank you so much. And we're so excited to, to see this delicious activity you guys have ready for us. Thank you so much for having us. We're really excited. And that question is actually a great segue into kind of what we want to talk about today. So our goal today is to talk about cells. Cells are considered the fundamental unit of life. Um, that is, a cell is the smallest thing that can still be considered living. Um, they come in hundreds of varieties of shapes, colors, and they have hundreds of functions throughout our bodies. And um, they kind of come in two different flavors, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> we're going to be talking about both animal and plant cells today. So cells work together to make tissues, which work together to make organs, and then organs work together to make organ systems. And that's what we are. We're considered to be organ systems that just function based on these smaller and smaller and smaller uh, components. So as I already mentioned, we're gonna be talking about plants and animal cells today, and we're going to present them to you in a fun and edible way so that you can make these at home and enjoy a delicious snack after our talk. So we're going to be talking about the smaller components that make up a cell. These are called organelles. Um, we kind of cheated a little bit and we already put down our frosting on this cake and here our frosting is representing the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm is uh, where most of the important activities of the cell occur. Uh, this contains molecules such as enzymes that are responsible for breaking down waste food and just generally aids in other metabolic processes. The cytoplasm is, resp is responsible for giving a cell its shape. So if you could imagine filling up a water balloon, the water inside is what ends up determining how big or small that water balloon is going to be. And so it helps fill out the cell and it keeps the organelles in their place. The next component that we want to talk about is the cell membrane. So here we're representing the cell membrane with icing. So a cell membrane is a protective outer covering that helps keep all of the contents of the cells from flowing out. If we're talking about that balloon again, this would be like the actual balloon itself. It's keeping all of the water or whatever it is that you're putting in the balloon inside. Cell membranes are Actually, one of the reasons that I mentioned that that question was a great segue is because the cell membrane is made of a phospholipid bilayer. So lipids or fats, like we just talked about, um, sometimes come with special attachments at the end, which are phosphate groups. And those phosphate groups are water soluble, meaning that water is attracted to those groups. And the lipid, the uh, hydrophobic lipid tails of our lipid bilipid membrane kind of face in on one another and they create this barrier between the organelles and the cytoplasm and the outside of the cell and just other cells and other things in the environment. So now that we've talked a little bit about the um, cell membrane, I can start talking about the cell wall. So this is kind of where we start to see a bit of the differentiation between animal and plant cells. Plant cells have a cell wall that surrounds the cell membrane. Uh, the cell wall is made out of cellulose and it provides strength and rigidity to the cell. So when we think about plants being converted into things like cotton, like the cotton that you might use to uh, put on a wound or something, or paper or wood to build a house. All of these materials come from plants, but they are very rigid and strong. That's why we're able to make so many things out of them. And that's why your paper, you know, you're able to write on it, able to fold it and do whatever you want with it. Uh, that rigidity and strength comes from the cell walls of the plant. So part of the process of developing plants into more usable materials is kind of squishing out the contents of the cell and leaving behind that strong rigid cell wall. And here we're going to be representing the cell wall using um, tissue roll pieces that we're putting around the sides. 
uh, just to differentiate from that cell membrane. Are there uh, any questions so far? No questions so far. You guys are good to go. Awesome. Looks yummy though. <laughs> Thank you. So um, as I mentioned, that cell wall is particular to plant cells. And there are some other major differences between plant and animal cells. So animal cells tend to be smaller. Like I said, they don't have a cell wall. They typically keep their nucleus in the center as opposed to plants that keep them on the side. And that's the next component that we're going to be talking about. The nucleus is the brain or the control center of the cell. It's the structure that holds all of the DNA in the cell and it signals other cell parts to function in, the, in their proper manner. Here, we're going to be representing the nucleus with a cherry. And like I mentioned, the nucleus is the control center, the brain. Uh, whenever you see models of cells, whether in whatever stage they may be of, um, of mitosis, when you see chromosomes lining up, when you see little squigglies in the center of a more or less round shaped thing in the center of the cell, that is the nucleus. Can I interject for a second? Yes, please. I was just going to say that we have the cell divided in two. So this side is the round side is the animal cell and this side is the plant cell. And we only have one nucleus. Yes, so I forgot to mention that we are cheating a little bit in that we are representing both uh, animal and plant cells in one case. Um, so you'll see in the center is the nucleus. So you can pretend that that's the center of the animal cell and it is the edge of the plant cell. <laughs> so after the nucleus comes the nucleolus. So the nucleolus is the area of the cell where ribosomes are made. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about ribosomes in, the, in a little bit, but ribosomes are the factories where the necessary proteins for cell function are made. So again, in that question that you guys did right before we started, we talked about how proteins are highly abundant in the body and ribosomes are the place where those proteins are made up. So you can imagine that just like we have a lot of proteins in our body, we have a lot of ribosomes. And here we're going to be representing the nucleolus with a jelly bean. Mm -hmm. And surrounding both the nucleus and the nucleolus is the nuclear envelope. So in this case, the nuclear envelope is going to be considered the skin of the cherry. Uh, the nuclear envelope just provides structure to the nucleus and it surrounds and protects the cell and the nucleus and most importantly, the DNA that's stored within there. Um, you know, one of the most common ailments that people have is cancer, which is due to genetic mutations of um, different molecules within our cells. So we want to protect our DNA as much as possible and prevent that mutation. After talking about the nucleus, we're gonna kind of expand outward from there. The next component that we wanna talk about is the endoplasmic reticulum. So the endoplasmic reticulum also comes in two flavors, um, rough and smooth. Uh, the ER or endoplasmic reticulum as a whole is a place where materials or chemical reactions happen uh, before moving these products into other areas of the cell. The rough endoplasmic reticulum is called that because it has ribosomes all across its surface. Here we're going to be representing the endoplasmic reticulum with a fruit roll-up and the ribosomes will be small dots of icing across its surface on the rough ER. Um, so Cisco, yep. just to confirm, okay, so the left side, or I'm looking at my left. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, the left side is the animal cell. It's, it's the a little cell, bit right. more rounded off. And then the right, then side, the right side is, is the, the plant. plant cell. And so the yep. plant cell, the Tootsie Rolls are representing that the plant cell's cell wall is more rigid, correct? Exactly. Okay, I just wanted to make they sure. They provide more structure for that side of the cell, um, just like a cell wall, uh, you know, gives more rigidity and strength to a plant cell. Gotcha, cool, thank you. No problem. So as we're putting down those fruit roll-ups representing our endoplasmic reticulum, 
Um, I was just mentioning that the rough ER has ribosomes all across its surface that specifically make those proteins that are important to the cell, like I mentioned before. And the endoplasmic reticulum normally comes right off of the nucleus. So whenever you look at a cell under a microscope, you tend to see a small circle at some point, whether it be in the center in an animal cell or to the side in a plant cell. And then coming off of that is that endoplasmic reticulum. And it's called that because uh, reticulum comes from the Latin word reticula, uh, which means net. So it acts as the net surrounding the nucleus. And you know, one of the things that I mentioned earlier is that often things are produced there that then either go to other parts of the cell or come back to the nucleus uh, when different functions need to be signaled. Following the endoplasmic reticulum, we're going to talk about the Golgi apparatus. This is the one with the fun name. <laughs> the Golgi apparatus packages and transports cellular materials all around the cell. It's most well known for looking like an accordion or a sack of pancakes. Here we are going to be representing it using a fruit by the foot. It's a long candy that you can fold up to look almost like an accordion, just like the Golgi apparatus looks like. And um, the name Golgi apparatus actually comes from the scientist who found it. Uh, his name was Golgi, of course. So that's where it gets its uh, funny name from. <laughs> uh, following the Golgi apparatus, we're going to talk again about one of these organelles that are specific to one type of cell. So in this case, again, it's plant cells. In plant in uh, plant cells and in plants as a whole, we know that they don't consume food the way that we do. So we have to get our nutrients from outside sources, whatever, you know, whether that be through whatever we eat or drink. Plants don't really have mouths to do that unless you're talking about something like a Venus flytrap. But for the most part, plants rely on photosynthesis. Now, in order for photosynthesis to happen, happen, there needs to be something within the cells of plants where these reactions can occur to create the uh, nutrients for the plant. And those are called chloroplasts. Here we're representing the, chloropla the chloroplasts with green tootsie rolls. They're special structures specific to plant cells and their job within the plant cell is to manufacture the food which the plant consumes by undergoing photosynthesis. So um, if you've learned about cells at any point before, specifically plant cells, you've probably heard of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is like the plant's food, right? And it gives plants their characteristic green color, and that comes from chloroplast. Now going back to cells in general, we're going to talk about vacuoles. So vacuoles are like storage spaces for the cell. That's where uh, water, waste, and other cellular materials throughout the cell are stored. And although both plant and animal cells have vacuoles, they differ in that plants tend to have one singular vacuole, whereas animal cells have many vacuoles. Here we're going to be representing them using some blue frosting, as Liz is, uh, blue frosting, as uh, Liz is showing. And, uh, you know, part of the reason for plant cells having only one vacuole, uh, at least in research, has, has shown that it's for that structure and rigidity of the plant cell. So you may notice that plant cells, not plant cells, plants as a whole, tend to stand straight up. They, you know, a lot of people like to say, oh, they're going towards the sun. Um, but in reality, it's a little bit more on the uh, cellular side that this consequence happens. So the cell wall of the plant cell gives a little bit of structure and rigidity, and so does this vacuole. In containing all of this water or waste or other cellular materials in one storage space, plant cells are able to maintain their uh, structure a little bit better than animal cells which is why, again, um, they're able to stand, why plants are able to stand straight up. After vacuoles, the next organelle that we're going to talk about is a very, very popular one, the mitochondria. So I'm sure that all of you just got flashbacks to saying 
The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. <laughs> That's what everyone learns in their science class. More specifically, the mitochondria is a site of ATP synthesis in the cell. And ATP is a very important molecule within the cell. It's kind of like the energy currency of the cell for all reactions that are happening, for any movement of materials within the cell, for any process to happen, ATP is in some way exchanged. Here we're gonna be representing the mitochondria with the um, purple jelly beans. <laughs> and a fun fact about mitochondria, mitochondria have their own DNA. And one of the things that are kind of special about this mitochondrial DNA is that you only get that from the maternal side. So you can track your maternal lineage via mitochondria, which we cannot do with regular um, nuclear DNA. Can I ask another question? Yes, please. Confirmation. So the green dots on the plant cell, what are those called again? Uh, those are the chloroplasts. Chloroplasts. Okay. I wanted to say chloro something. Cool. And what do those <laughs> serve? What function do those serve again in the plant cell? So chloroplasts uh, create, they uh, are the nutrient manufacturing factories or plants of plant cells. Uh, that's where chlorophyll is uh, synthesized and then used uh, in photosynthesis to give nutrients to a plant. Awesome. Thank you. I hope that answers your question, Kelly. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so now that we've talked about mitochondria, we're going to talk about a little bit of the uh, lesser known organelles, one of which is called a lysozyme. Uh, lysosome, I'm sorry. Lysosomes produce lysozyme, which is an enzyme that works to break down different uh, molecules or components of the cell. So lysozyme, lysosomes, sorry, are special structures pre present in both plant and animal cells that contain digestive chemicals like lysozyme to break down food molecules, old cell parts that need to be replaced, and even the whole cell when it's time to recycle the cell. So one thing that um, you may have learned when talking about cells is that they are not immortal. Cells uh, break down, they need to be replaced, they get old. Part of the way that they do that is using the, these lysosomes. So lysosomes have those chemicals within them and normally they're used to break down whatever food particles or molecules that come into the cell. But let's say that a part of the cell needs to be replaced. So rather than breaking down the entire cell, uh, a cell may choose to break down a small component and then reuse the components that it broke down to rebuild a structure. And when it is time for that cell to recycle itself entirely, lysosomes release those chemicals into the entirety of the cell and they allow it to undergo apoptosis which is what we call programmed cell death. But those nutrients or molecules that are within the cell can then go and be reused to make a new cell. And uh, here we are going to represent them using the yellow dots that you see everywhere. And dots are those little uh, jelly gummies. <laughs> uh, after lysosomes, we want to talk about ribosomes. So I've mentioned ribosomes a couple of times, both when we were talking about the endoplasmic reticulum and um, when we were talking about the, um, the nucleolus. So ribosomes are the small protein factories that mainly reside on the ER near the nucleus. Uh, what, you know, the question that you guys had before coming into our presentation was about what's the uh, second most common uh, or abundant um, molecule type within the body, I believe. And the answer was proteins. Proteins are really fundamental to our functioning as a whole, and not just for humans or animals, but also for plants. Um, proteins do everything from providing structure to acting as um, enzymes and other reactions. 
And overall, they are kind of like the multi-tool of the cell. They are able to help the cell undergo a variety of functions that are totally necessary for its survival. Here we're going to be representing the ribosomes with uh, red or pink dots of frosting all around the cell because they are tiny. And although they're mostly located on the endoplasmic reticulum, they are known to float away every now and then. And they are still able to uh, produce those proteins when they float away. I have a question for you from the audience. Sorry to yep. pause you. Uh, so. No, this is kind of a, this is a hard question, um, but this is from Jacqueline. Uh, well, actually I got it from same question from two different people. Um, but <laughs> the real question was, what would you think of making one of these cell cakes for every cell in the human body? That was for Liz, mm. <laughs> but also the question uh, I think alludes to what are some of the big differences um, between those different cells in the human body? So those would all be animal cells. Right. Between or, the different um, the what structure. in the body? Different cells in the human body. So um, like brain cells, muscle cells, skin cells, things like that. Gotcha. So um, do you want to get that one, Liz? Um, do you, I think you could probably give them a better answer. If you know. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I mean, I would not want to make one of these cells for every single cell in the human body. That would be a lot of cells. <laughs> And a lot of candy. Um, yeah, so one of the things that I had uh, mentioned earlier on is that cells have a lot of different functions in mm -hmm, our body. Right. And part of the reason for that is because there are so many types. So for example, you know, um, some of the ones that you mentioned like brain cells or nerve cells, neurons, those are responsible for how we feel things, how we perceive things, our sight, our hearing, our taste, all of our senses are dominated by neurons that are present all throughout our body. Mm -hmm. um, some cells are everywhere like neurons and then other ones not so much. So if we're talking about for example liver cells, uh, liver cells are, are of course only present in your liver and their only purpose is to um, help the liver do its thing and break down whatever fluids are coming into your body and make sure that you're not being poisoned. Um, so one of the things that I had mentioned is that cells work together to make tissues and then mm -hmm. tissues work together to make organs. So if you think about that, we have a wide variety of organs within our body, right? Liver, stomach, our skin is a very large organ. Um, uh, you know, I'm just kind of like naming things, uh, small intestine, large intestine, lungs, heart, um, gallbladder, all of these different organs in your body are made up of distinct tissues. And those tissues are made up out of distinct cells. And kind of what characterizes them is both their structure, and that structure is directly correlated to their functionality. So, um, you know, your heart cells are always, you know, mostly your heart cells are conducting electricity that allows your heart to know when to pump and when not to pump. And when you get irreg irregularities there, that's when you get different heart diseases. Mm -hmm. um, our neurons are also non-regenerative. So that means that they can't just rebuild themselves unlike a blood cell. So because our neurons are non-regenerative, um, that's when you get into cases of uh, when people have accidents or if you ever get a cut on your finger like I have, uh, you may lose some sensation in your fingertip because you've lost some neurons. And that's different from something like a red blood cell or a white blood cell that um, is able to regenerate itself. Gotcha, thank you. And another question, um, this is a burning question because Margot has asked me very specifically, did you make the cake yourself, Liz? Um, I did make the, I mean, it's from a box, but I did bake this cake. Um, it's a little sad looking. I'm in North Carolina right now, so it's very hot and humid here. <laughs> so it's melting as time goes on. That's okay. It's, that's okay. It looks beautiful. Um, <laughs> and I'll let you guys, I'm going to let you finish before I, there's a couple more questions, but I don't want to cut you off before you're done. Uh, yeah, we're no just about problem. finished, I think. Perfect. Yep. We have our last organelle right now. We're going to talk about vesicles and then we'll open up for questions. So vesicles are organelles that mainly look like small sacs 
and their purpose is to transport materials into and out of cells. They can take cellular material created in one part of a cell and transport that to another cell nearby or far away. So kind of like how we were just talking about neurons and nerve cells, they are constantly communicating with one another and vesicles are particularly important there because a neuron or nerve cell will build up a small amount of let's say serotonin or melatonin and it will pass that in the vesicle to a neighboring nerve cell and then that um, neighboring nerve cell takes in those vesicles and it knows how much melatonin or serotonin is present in that other cell or in the environment as a whole and that signals things like when we need to sleep, when we're hungry, when we um, need more water, things of that nature. And uh, here we're representing them using orange to zero. <laughs> and yeah, now we're open to any questions or anything. Awesome. I think one that's particularly fitting since you guys did split this into um, a plant cell and an animal cell is what about those cells um, enable plants to live for hundreds of years um, while animals obviously have a shorter lifespan? Is there anything about the cells that enables that? Yeah, definitely one of those things that uh, we've mentioned before is that regeneration, regenerability right, right. of cells. So some cells like red blood cells or white blood cells, which fight infection, they're able to go through apoptosis and then more cells are regenerated in some organ in the body. But other cells like our neurons, um, some of our organ cells like liver cells, kidney cells, those are non-regenerable. So over time, it's kind of like whatever you get at birth, your body will produce a certain amount in life, but then you aren't able to produce those forever. So that's why when people get into, say, um, an accident and then they lose the ability to um, walk, they're not able to regenerate that ability as of now. But, um, you know, scientists are working very hard on trying to, read, um, to work with some of these really cool technologies that, um, will help us regenerate some of those cells. And perhaps in time, we will be able to be a little bit more like plants and last a little bit longer. Awesome, thank you. And I think one other question, uh, there's a lot of good questions on here, um, but oh, there's one that's just, it's like so open-ended. Well, whatever, why not? We'll try it. Okay, so Anushka is asking, if you lose too many neurons, I assume neuron cells, then what is the worst that can happen? So there's a lot of diseases um, where that is actually the case, or maybe not where you're losing neurons, but where your neurons are kind of being attacked. Um, one kind of popular one is multiple sclerosis, where the covering of your nerve cells degenerates over time. Kind of what starts to happen is that you lose a little bit of like your motor functions or motor skills. And, um, you know, neurons are one of the main components of your brain as well. So over time, you start to forget things a little bit more. And um, yeah, just, you know, due to the fact that neurons are present all over our body, you do over time start to see some significant change, whether it be in mobility or in uh, memory or just cognitive processing. Yeah. And then one, okay, this is going to be the final one. Sorry. I said that would be, but I think this is a good one to end with. Um, both of you, what are your favorite organelles in cells personally? <sighs> um, I'm a big fan of the mitochondria because I'm not a bio major. So I love throwing the fact out that mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Um, <laughs> the <piece. laughs> proved that I know something about biology. Um, I personally love the nucleus quite a bit. Uh, I think of the cell as kind of like a big building and, you know, the cell membrane is the front door, but then when you get closer and closer to the heart of it, the nucleus acts as its own like gated off part of the cell and it's really, really important. And, maintaining that DNA 
in order for us to function properly. So I really appreciate the nucleus. Awesome. I can relate to the mitochondria. I remember the mighty mitochondria from high school. Yes. Yeah, it's got the sugar and then it's got like the mother DNA that gets passed down. Super cool, I know. Well, thank you guys so much. And um, for everyone watching, again, just remember that you can watch these videos again. Um, you can get the supplies later and do this to yourself at home. If you already did it, make sure you tag us on Instagram or Facebook so that we can share all of this uh, stay home STEM today. <laughs>